I'm always flattered when anyone wants to listen to my particular brand of madness, so I appreciate uh, you guys being here for that. I think sort of two administrative notes uh, before I get going. The first is that Rohit and I did not actually uh, collude and collaborate. I had no idea what he was going to say and I, as he talked. I was, was really drawn into a lot of the similarities in our message and our, and our manner of thinking, and I think it really speaks to something that is, is sort of hugely important in the market. The second is I tend to use the term CIO and CTO fairly interchangeably. I think it's somewhat of a fungible role and it's less about what those individuals do and more about what their organizations find important that somebody ends up with one title or the other. So if I, I, I'm using the wrong you know, sort of person for the role you're imagining, understand that I, I tend to conflate those two. I wanted to start off with Emmanuel Kant, and that's sort of an odd thing to start talking about customer centricity in IT with, but his categorical imperative is hugely important to me and how I live my life, how I treat my teams, and really how I try and operate my business. And this is all just a really long-winded way of saying treat people as ends unto themselves and never means, right? So we care about them because they are them, not what they can do for us or, or what they can provide us with. And I think that's missing in IT. We, we sort of, we really let go of that, you know, sort of much to our uh, chagrin. And so we're now in this age of, of hypercentricity and digital transformation. I don't think you can read a, a website, a newspaper, anything without talking about digital transformation. And when we're talking about digital transformation, normally they're gonna talk about transforming the business or they're gonna talk about transforming the products. What's left out of the conversation is how do we transform the teams that build these goods and services how do we transform the people in our organizations to get them to ultimate customer centricity? IT folks, even myself sort of included, can be very, very bad about getting caught up in the fun technology parts, right? I want to build a Cassandra cluster. I want to use Kinesis fire hose. I'm really concerned with things going faster, bigger, better. Sometimes even I forget about the people and there's an irony there that it's all people, right? Computers are easy to deal with. You tell a computer what to do, it does it, but dealing with people who deal with computers is much more difficult and we need to learn to be patient and we need to learn to focus on them and instead of the technology itself. So in the marketplace, this customer centricity, you know, with the rise of the internet, we've really democratized technology. There is infinite choice out there in the marketplace and your customers can leave you instantly if there's a better good, a better service, somebody who's catering to you. And what we're starting to see in our own companies is that our employees are leaving us. They are choosing, they are opting out. All technology that we build, even if it's an internal IT system, is now graded as the best of brand consumer experience. Everything that people have in their personal lives, they require at work. They require the same sorts of experiences, the same sorts of interactions with their work systems and their IT groups that they get when they go to Facebook, Google, YouTube. They are expecting that same sort of experience and when they don't get it, they opt out. They go to companies who provide them with that and so we need to really start focusing on the people in our businesses and again in our IT groups looking at them as individuals, treating them as an ends, and not even them, uh, but all of the people who use these systems. And I'm gonna pause for a second and, and go on a bit of a rant. And it's one of my two favorite rants, the other one's coming a little bit later, I promise. Uh, please don't run for the doors as I do it. They're not users, right? They're, they're just not users. It, it, it drives me absolutely batshit insane. My teams hear me go on and on about this. I've tried to abolish the word at work. I have been largely unsuccessful. There is an entire industry of, of lexicon and vernacular that keeps it prevalent and I can't get rid of it. But, but they're not users. They are people, right? They're your brothers, your sisters, your wives, your partners, your husbands, your uncles, your cousins. They're your friends, your family. They are plumbers, lawyers, doctors, artists, musicians. Some of them are even executives, right? They are human beings, they're not users. 
I, I'm curious, does anyone know the only other profession than IT that has users? <laughs> Drug dealers. Um, that's kind of a problem, right? I mean, has anybody sat back and thought that we talk about our customers the same way drug dealers do. You know, when I wrote this talk, the, the line was, you know, drug dealers and I don't want anything to do with them. And then as I practiced and I reflected, I was like, crap. Wait, um, software, we give the first hit away for free? <laughs> yeah. Uh, second, oh, the high that everybody gets from clicking, liking, and sharing. All right, so we're really simple, but worse, we treat our, our customers and our people as means and not ends to themselves. You know, these, these people don't exist to use the systems that we create, right? The stuff that we build, the stuff that we, we force them to use, they don't exist to use it. They exist to create, to accomplish. And, and we really miss that. We, much like drug dealers, we just sort of treat them as a mechanism to consume the products or the things that we think they need or that they want or we're gonna build for them, it's, it, it's, it's kind of a problem and it, it drives me nuts. Again, I will try to get my team to stop, they will not, but I will uh, sort of keep moving with that. But the one sort of group that really does have uh, customer centricity at heart is the people who do product management. And I don't mean project management, but true product. And the businesses that are accelerating in the industries are the ones who understand customer centricity. If you go to any product development conference, I guarantee you two thirds of the speakers are going to talk about customer centricity. They're going to talk about user research. Again, they even use that word. I can't stop them, it drives me nuts. But they are more interested in what these people want and what they need than what they want to do, right? The age of charismatic design where you just have this one big grand idea and then you know everything because you're the subject matter expert, it's done. These folks have, have nailed customer centricity and, and the zeitgeist is, is just sort of overflowing with it. And, and in the IT group, you know, we, we really haven't and, and I try, but every now and then sort of life knocks on your door and reminds you that people matter. And the first time that it happened for me, uh, fairly recently, when was, I was at PBS, and the wake-up call was a handwritten letter. So my ombudsman came by with a handwritten letter from an elderly woman in the Midwest. She wanted to watch our videos. <clears throat> she could not. She wanted help. There was no phone number. There was no email address. There was no one she could go to to get help. So she actually wrote a letter to him asking if he could help her. He could not, so he came and, and knocked on my door and, if I, and, and asked if I could. And it really sort of st started spurring, uh, you know, a lot of thinking in my mind. And at that time, you know, I took PBS and pardon me. Got a little dry here. Uh, it was in the heyday of us for Don Abbey. Right, Don Abbey was on its third or fourth season in the U.S. It was going like gangbusters. It was a huge time. I had been brought into PBS to build their cloud infrastructure and fix their support organization. So they had been doing digital transformation of their products for two years and had built a number of products, login systems, CMSs, video portals, data repositories. They had all accelerated into the market. People were consuming these services. They were loving it, they wanted more and more and more, and PBS's ability to support them was missing. It was a little bit lackluster, and they asked me to try and help. When I got there, the average ticket resolution time was 90 days. So it took 90 days for anyone to get support or, or help, and I got that down to five, really in about a month and a half. It's really simple triage sort of a separation of duties, fixing some black holes. That wasn't their, their big problem. The interesting thing about it, the only people who were putting tickets were inside the ecosystem. They were inside the walled garden. PBS is a little different than the BBC in that it is a member organization. So all of the stations around the United States actually pay dues to PBS corporate who creates the content, the services that the stations then use to interact with their end audiences. But the stations owned the end relationship between the viewing audience 
and themselves, and that wasn't passed through to corporate. So all of our products were actually designed to be completely inaccessible. There were no support links. There was deliberately no way for people to contact us and get help. That's been fixed. That's a, a mind shift that has, has separated, and they've you know now gone on to support the general public in a, in a fantastic sort of way. But at that time, there was no way to get help. And again, Don Abbey blowing up. We were going like gangbusters, and some of my stations started making noise. They started talking about the phone calls that they were getting about buffering issues, much like the letter I got. People were unable to uh, consume the content, and so we started to take it seriously, right? I had a letter, somebody actually meant enough to write me a physical letter on paper saying, help please, uh, and I have uh, some very big stakeholders making a lot of noise. We probably need to do something about this. So I did what every self-respecting IT person would do. Blame the vendor, <laughs> right? Yeah, so we decided, okay, we've got buffering issues. It's gotta be our problem with the CDN, our content distribution network. It's just not keeping up with the demand. So I'm gonna call them. And it was Amazon, so we were using their CloudFront service. But we were a very, very early customer of theirs. And um, pushing about two petabyte of video through the system at, at the time, a significant amount for, for back then. And I called them ready to yell. I put on my armor, I, I had my, my best, you know, blame the vendor uh, sort of setup going, because we know what happens when you call a vendor, right? They, they go through three stages, lie, deny, demand, proof. <laughs> and uh, I was ready to deal with, with all of those with, with great fury and wrath. Uh, and they stopped me almost instantly with a quote that has changed my life and changed the way I build my teams and run all of my operations. And it's up there. The first thing that they said, I yelled at them for about 30 seconds. And it was like, you know what? Hang on. You might have a problem, but I can't tell you if you do. I was like, what? And he said, here at Amazon, we, we have a philosophy. And it goes like this, barring sufficient instrumentation to prove otherwise, all customer complaints must be assumed to be true. And it blew my mind, right? It was, it was radical for anybody to say that. They took the onus of proof on themselves to know whether or not they had a problem. That's a big thing, right? So they said, because I can't tell you I don't have a problem, I'm gonna to listen to you and I'm gonna assume I have a problem. They were completely blind. Uh, and, and so I high-fived my boss. I was like, yes, score, they're gonna help us. Walked out of the meeting and I realized that we were blind as well. I was blind because I just knew buffering. I couldn't say how much buffering, how many, uh, how many people were affected by it. Is it only on Thursdays? Is it every video? Is it one video? Is it just stuff in mobile? I had no instrumentation myself to actually solve the problem, and I probably needed to listen to Amazon and fix that if we wanted to get through you know, everything, instead of just relying on them going to try and solve something that they had no data to solve either. And so I got to crash the roadmap, and it was glorious. You know, we went in and took a sledgehammer to the product roadmap. I was lucky my boss at the time, uh, much like me now, had all of operations, all of engineering, and all of product reporting to him. And that makes it really easy to wreck a, a sprint uh, if you need to. And so we went and said we need metrics, and they went through and updated the video player in two or three days to start capturing start times, you know, time from start to download, uh, buffering per session, any number of different metrics they put in to the video players. They deployed it, we immediately updated Splunk to start consuming all of this information, make dashboards so that we could understand what was the experience of our audience, right? Not just which videos were popular, all of our metrics were vanity metrics, right? This video was doing really good, it was watched like a million times, yay us, and wow, that one's only three. Why is it on the main page? It was all about vanity and not actually about our end audience. It was, it was inward focus and not external. So, we get the player out and data starts coming pouring in and you know about a day and a half later I look at the reports and we find out that the experience was completely bifurcated. So if you were having a good session, your session was great. You got amazing video and had a fantastically wonderful time. 
But if your session was bad, it was really bad. I mean, 10, 20, 30 seconds of buffering per session, sometimes five, 10, 20, 100 buffering events. If you, we all watch online video. If you can imagine trying to watch something that pauses for two seconds every like minute, you would turn it off. It was a terrible experience. And we were like, okay, this makes no sense. How can it be really awesome and really, really bad all at the same time? So we went and found the tech lead for the, the video portal at the time, a brilliant guy who's now actually the VP of, or senior director of engineering at, at PBS running all of their teams, you know, just knew more about online video than anything. So we asked him, how could this be? How could we be having you know, this experience? And so talking to him, we learned that the entire setup was designed for a high quality experience. So it was designed to build the best possible experience for the people who could experience it. Whoops. Little bit of a mismatch with our customers. You know, PBS, because it is a member organization and it is all throughout the US, has uh, an, an interesting characteristic to it. We have viewers from the age of one to 10 where they age out of our content and then they come back to us around 45 or 50. And many, many, many of them are rural without high-speed internet. And so we had designed the service the way technologists would or a startup would. We tried to build a high-quality experience that would wow influencers and would drive adoption without actually thinking that our brand was so strong, we didn't need to win the influencers. We didn't need to win market share. We had a built-in customer base that we needed to serve. It was, it was a pretty big miss, so we went back, and again, the entire roadmap is in shambles. I mean, there's like a smoking crater over on the side of the building that, that was where the, the audience-facing side you know, roadmap used to be, and we changed the way the video portal worked. We added five new bit rates. We added bit rates lower than I think anyone was actually comfortable with. Uh, so that there was at least a minimum experience possible. People wanted to consume the content, we wanted them to consume the content, so we made sure there was a minimal experience. Then we did something that frankly embarrassed all of us uh, that we didn't realize in the first place. We started with the lowest bit rate and then scaled up as your connection would allow. Instead of starting with that really, really sweet 1080p video and then scaling down to meet your connection. And then finally, we added pre-buffering, right? So we would actually delay the start time to make sure that video had already been downloaded. People are willing to wait five, 10 seconds for a video to play. But what they really hate is five and 10 seconds of buffering once it started playing. And the experience went radically up. We were able to give a much, much broader experience to all of our constituents when we took the time to think about who they were and not what we wanted. Again, you know, it's a trap that we all sort of fall into. We're, we're smart people, we do this for a living, we think we know what, what people want. We, we sometimes, it's what we want or what we want for them. Uh, and so we built to that and we took the time to actually listen and go and fix it. It was hugely important. And so I'm gonna go uh, sort of on a bit of a departure uh, before I talk about the Telegraph, about the changing role of the CIO and the CTO, because I believe it's radically important. Both of these professions over the years have been caretakers. They were just looked at to keep things running, make it a little bit faster, make it a lot cheaper, right? They weren't ever asked to provide value to the business. They weren't asked to provide value to the customers. They were really tasked to just caretake and, and drive all costs. And when we talk about customer centricity and, and thinking about IT organizations and internal systems, driving costs might help the bottom line, but it doesn't help productivity. The entire industry has missed the part about doing a good job or providing goods and services that make people happier, more fulfilled, more productive. I've, I've lived through conversations about how much a laptop should cost, where uh, somebody wanted to spend only $500 on a laptop, uh, actually it was pounds, 500 pounds on a laptop instead of 1,000 pounds on a laptop on an Apple, right? We don't want to buy Apple because people will get uppity. 
right? We, we want to buy this cheap laptop, it's, it's going to be a cost. And they're like, that's, that's great. And that person just quit. What did you pay in recruiting fees for them? You're quibbling about 500 pounds when you dropped 10,000 pounds on a recruiting fee and they just walked out the door. The entire mindset about driving down costs is completely wrong. It's treated as cost center and that role is starting to shift, but we all have to shift with it. Guys like me have to shift with it and remember that the people are at the forefront, right? It is better to spend an extra 500 pounds per head for, to keep somebody happy. If they identify with this slick aluminum piece of equipment instead of a bad piece of plastic, if I can keep somebody in their position or make them do 10% more work for 500 pounds, I will do it all day, every day. And we have to learn how to fight our colleagues in the CFO office uh, to do all of that, which can be a challenge, I certainly admit. Now, I've talked about PBS and, and a little bit of <coughs> cloud computing and sort of customer centricity. I want to tell you about my background a little bit, so why this matters or where I'm coming from or, again, why my particular brand of madness is where it is. I um, came out of the Marine Corps, so I was a United States Marine. I was an engineer equipment mechanic while I was in the Marine Corps, which meant I got to fix really big construction equipment which is the grown-up equivalent of playing with Tonka toys all day. It was uh, glorious, I loved it. I got out of the Marine Corps and I wanted to do that for a living, but there was a problem. I had spent all of my money in the Marine Corps riding motorcycles and basically turning money into noise. Uh, and I had no money and I needed about five to $10,000 worth of equipment to actually work in that profession. Right? You can't even start unless you have an enormous toolbox that you can roll on site and say, I'm here with everything I need to fix your equipment. So I didn't get to do that. I started waiting tables because I had to make money uh, instantly. So I went into waiting tables, great place to learn customer service very, very rapidly. And then I got a call from a friend of mine who said, I got a job at a call center doing technical support for compact computers. That probably tells you how old I am, uh, just because <laughs> I don't think they actually exist anymore. And there aren't a lot of call centers in the US doing technical support. So I remember the interview to this day. They called me and the recruiter said, all right, one question. Great. Name five DOS commands. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I did myself even further. So I start launching into all of the DOS commands. Dear, FDisk, format, edit. I start talking about, you know, modifying autoexec.bat, config sys, memory management, you know, placing stuff in high or low memory. I was, and he was like, stop, 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 stop. Come in. You got the job, come in. It's great. So I got the job and it was a very, very formative job for me because there is nothing harder in all of IT than walking through someone opening a box with a brand new computer in it, turning it on, using a brand new operating system that was just released Windows 95 for the first time and walking them through setting up a PPP modem connection. We don't have to do that anymore these days. Love technology, thank you. But it was very hard because what made it even harder is we didn't have remote access back then, right? They didn't even have a modem connection. You had to learn how to see everything through your customer's eyes. You had to walk them through their problem, knowing every bit of the operating system, getting feedback from them. And that's where I learned how to see through people's eyes. And it was radically, radically important for how I built and shaped support organizations. You know, IT groups forget the balance of power all too often. When any of our customers call us, they are already at a disadvantage. They either can't do something or don't know something, and they have to call the person who does. And no one likes that. Uh, and so they're already at a disadvantage. They can't do what they want to do, and they're, they're paused, and they've got to talk to somebody. And we tend to have a problem because it's really easy for us. It's natural. We do it all day, every day. We make it sound too easy. We make them sound dumb for not knowing all of these things do because we haven't looked through their eyes recently. And it was a huge lesson and, and something that I took and really talks about the changing face of technology. So I left PDS and I was lucky enough to get a job at the Telegraph here in London. And, um, 
they had they were undergoing a digital transformation they've been undergoing it for a while they are you know there now they have a fantastic CIO and a wonderful team who's building a lot of really great products but at the time they were still trying to transform they were trying to get out of this this old mind and this old mindset they had I got a job because they had an IT problem their IT support organization was in shambles. They had just outsourced it to a global outsourced IT services provider. Uh, it was a complete disaster. There was zero faith in that IT group. Uh, and I was called in to fix that. Um, so again, I promised you another rant, uh, and, and this is it. I actually think that ITIL is probably the most offensive four-letter word in all of humanity. I can let people go on profanely for hours and hours and hours and not even be bothered, but ITIL makes my blood boil. You know, when we talk about customer centricity, and especially with IT, ITIL is the absence of that. It resolves, it robs all humanity from everyone. It values process over people like the day is long. It is the most prescriptive, backwards thinking way of doing anything that I can possibly imagine drives me absolutely nuts. And that's what I walked into. An out uh, outsourced IT services provider that lived ITIL like the agile purists lived the manifesto. I mean, it was, it was crazy. Their cultural value was compliance and ours was quality. There was already a mismatch. And when you talk about cultural currency, you know, it's, it's not a country or a monetary form. It's what organizations and individuals find uh, valuable. And for them, it was compliance and contract adherence. And the best example I can give of dealing with them, is, or sort of give you two. The first is I asked a guy to move a monitor from one desk, three desks over, he said, no. What do you mean, no? Your, your desktop support guy, that is part of the desktop computer. I need you to pick up that monitor and put it right there. He said, no, it's out of scope. <clears throat> out of scope, are you kidding me? Yeah, out of scope, it's not in the contract. It doesn't say anything about moving equipment, but, but it's desktop support. You would be technically supporting the monitor <laughs> physically if you lifted it and carried it over there and he was like, out of, out of scope. And, wouldn't budge, uh, and and so the second, and really just their mindset. If if the contract had said paint a wall, I could ask one of their team members to paint a wall, and he would dip the paint in the brush and walk over and go, "Penny, I painted the wall, but the entire wall is not painted." Uh, so I looked at the contract. It said nothing about paint the entire wall. It, it said paint wall. But the line isn't straight. Uh, again, it doesn't. Uh, there's no indication of straight lines. Uh, merely that paint be applied to the walls. I have done so. Please pay me. It was absolutely maddening. They were really just concerned with anything that the contract said, any times that the contract said, and would defend it with with vengeance and and just this amazing resolve. They would not budge and actually help someone. It was. Uh, it was insane. And so after sort of 90 days of working there, dealing with this, with my number one job, they, they asked me, this was really my, my, my number one job, we need you to fix the relationship. That was, and, and I tried. Dear Lord, I tried. Uh, <laughs> but they were intractable, and so I went into my boss and I said, hey, you have two choices. He said, great, what? He said, number one, give me a raise. He's like, why? He's like, you just got here, I, you know just got here, why, why do you need a race? It's like, it's gonna take a hell of a lot of gin for me to go to sleep at night because I'm gonna drink myself senseless if I have to deal with these clowns uh, anymore. And he said, okay, right, what's the second option? He said, I'm gonna blow it up and I'm gonna bring it all in house. And so he said, giddy up. Uh, we're Americans, both of us, and so we do actually say things like that. We can't really help ourselves, it, it's part of the vernacular. So. I told him, he was like, you know, look, there's a contract in place. It's a five-year contract. What are you going to do? I said, don't worry about it. I got that part, right? You know, if, if I can get out of this, can I bring it all back in-house? And he said, yeah, go for it. Make it, make it happen, you know? You know? Uh, and so that's what I did. I, I, I blew it up. Uh, we brought it all in-house, and I did it in about 90 days. Uh, because once we broke the contract, 
they wanted to get out unbelievably quickly. I thought it was gonna be a six month transition after we got through the negotiations, they were a little less than pleased, as you could imagine, uh, with the millions and millions of pounds uh, on the line that they had just lost on a five year IT services contract. So they wanted out in 90 days. I had to hire 20 people in 90 days in London. Uh, I think all of you can imagine how unbelievably difficult that is to pull off. We also had to build an entirely new support system as a result. If you uh, take any tips from my talk, the first about instrumentation, the second is never let a services provider own your tool chain, ever. Then you are beholden, you are going to have to replatform. It makes getting off of them that much more difficult. We were able to do it. Jira, uh, made by Atlassian, has a service desk plugin that is a fantastic product, super customizable. I'm not gonna show for them too terribly much, but I actually love it. And we were able to get two people who did service management and on-call management to actually take over and configure the system so that way we could hire. It was that easy to set up. Uh, it was absolutely fantastic. So we set that up and we took over the service with a zero day transition without the organization knowing we did anything. We told them and we warned everybody and we said we were going to do it and the day that we did it, a bunch of new faces had started and a bunch of old faces were, were out the door and our customers were none the wiser. There was no interruption to service throughout that whole process and it ended up being unbelievably successful as we did it and I credit it to the primary focus and the one thing that I did that really um, made it work and, and it sounds like madness, I abolished all SLAs. So I took the help desk, the IT service over and the first thing that I did was get rid of all SLAs. SLAs are problematic uh, because people will gain to them. They start focusing on the number or the metric, and again, the compliance to that metric. The former provider, that was their entire day, was did I get my call on time? Did I answer the phone fast enough? You know what? Nobody cares if you answered the phone fast enough if you don't help them. That was a really quick no out of scope, right? doesn't actually provide any satisfaction or help or, or productivity. And worse, people are people. They are not cookie cutters. They are not average 20 minute call times. If you know, Sally from accounting calls you and she needs 25 minutes of help, not 20 minutes, I want her to have 25 minutes of help. I don't want my help desk or my IT folks worrying about how long they've spent on the phone with her. I want her helped, I want her taken care of because if you don't spend that extra five minutes, here's what's gonna happen. She's gonna spend five, 10, 30 minutes complaining to her colleagues about what an idiot you are for lording over her and not helping her. Or worse, she's not actually going to get any work done for the rest of the day. The amount of corporate productivity that is lost just for trying to goose some numbers to make somebody have a, like a rag status in a report show green is astronomical and it comes from not actually focusing on the people. And so what we found as we did this, and I said, you know, I don't care how long your calls are, you know, try and answer the phone within like 10, 15 seconds, please, if you can. Uh, and really, I don't care how long it takes, but help people. Job one, help people. And people said this was madness and they, they, they thought I was crazy for it. The other thing that I did is I changed the people I hired. Anyone who works in IT knows about the brilliant jerk. You know, the guy who, or girl whose mind is, is vast and they know everything but they are a pain in the ass to deal with. I prioritized hiring everyone for a customer service background, right? I waited tables. I know what it's like to bring a steak or, or, or uh, the wrong glass of wine or bring somebody to the fish when they wanted a steak. Uh, or vice versa and, and the look on their face and how much that impacts them. So I hired everyone with a customer service focus because, and what I told HR because they thought I was insane, uh, was that I can teach anyone how to fix a computer. I can teach anyone how to follow a process, solve a problem, go through a run book. I cannot teach people how to be decent human beings. Right? That is not something you can teach. You can't teach people who don't care how to care for someone, and I needed people to care for people. And it worked. What we saw, oddly, and, and again, a reverse IT metric, is our ticket volumes went up. 
our customers were starting to interact with us again. And my bosses were like, well, your ticket volumes are higher. And I said, yes, glorious. And they said, this, how is this glorious, right? What about automation and, and sort of driving down the number of agents that you need and the number of staff? And I said, they don't care. I was like, let's do the ROI on the amount of work that these people are accomplishing because they can get help. Because they can print, they can review a story faster, they can get it through legal faster, they can pay bills faster, they can cut our paychecks faster, they can write their stories faster. This is all good. We want volumes to go high. And what we found, my teams actually asked what the SLAs were just so they wanted to get better and more efficient at it. And, and we put some light ones in just so that they, we, they could knew they were getting good results and that they could see progress. And we did customer service surveys. Our, our customer service went from the 80s to the 90s in terms of, of satisfaction. So it was, a, it was a win all around. But really the end job was that we took time on actually focusing on the customers, the people doing the work all day, not compliance, not what printer they should use, what software they should, shouldn't have, whether or not their antivirus was updated. Everything that we did was just trying to make them more effective and have a decent day while they were trying to do it. And productivity went up and, and sort of they were able to get on with their jobs with a minimum of friction, which was sort of glorious. And I think, you know, marketing likes to put quotes up here to deliver impactful messages, but I sort of, <laughs> I ask for robots and dinosaurs, they give me quotes. Uh, so one of the things that is common is that, that CIOs and CTOs commonly lose their jobs on multi-year transformation projects. Uh, and this is for two reasons in my mind. The first, uh, anything that spans multiple years is too long and you're doing it wrong. Uh, things should be broken into chunks, digestible, that are able to be built on for a change, right? Transformation does, it does not happen overnight. You can't big bang it. Uh, it is a series of small steps that ends up in a glorious conclusion. The second is that big multi-year projects do things to people not for them. Those big multi-year projects are not done with their customers in mind. They're not talking to their customers, asking them how they work, what they need. They are having these large-scale systems pushed on them. Maybe it's a Citrix setup with, a, with VDI. Maybe it's a new printing. Maybe it's a new accounting system. These are large things that are being done to them and not for them. And I'll tell you what, they resist every step of the way. The reason these projects fail is not because your Gantt chart isn't good enough or your project managers aren't good enough or that your IT team, IT team isn't good enough or that your CIO isn't smart enough. It's that everybody involved at the ground level resisted. They did it passively, they did it actively because they didn't want it and we didn't take time to bring them along on the journey to get it to fruition. And so finally, I'll uh, wrap this up because there's a totally sweet slide right after this that has directions to the bar where I know everybody wants to get to. But, you know, I started with the quote from, from Kant and his categorical imperative because I, I think it is actually important. It is not sort of lip service or, or something that I'm, I'm doing for a particular talk. We need to transform our IT departments and how they work so that way they are ultimately more successful. And I mean, I, I can't be more serious. If you focus on your people and all people as an ends rather than a means, your projects are going to be more successful, your departments are going to be more successful, and you're going to be more successful because the business is, and also as a human being, because you've acted sort of ethically instead of unethically. So really, please, uh, you know, do try that. Again, two lessons, instrumentation, and never be on your vendor's uh, uh, tool set. So thank you.